Okay, so we've seen this picture, Wes put it up, um, and we've heard a lot about basic ideas in, in quantum information science. And so, of course, as we've heard, there are lots of ways you can make a qubit, right, a quantum bit. Um, whether that's just superconducting, circuits, trapped ions, defects, and not just in diamond, of course, there are many different kinds of spin defects all throughout uh, the solid state uh, condensed matter science. Um, you can use photons, and everyone who works in these areas will tell you that theirs is the best implementation for whatever reason. But that's not quite true, because of course, each of them have their own drawbacks, right? And so it does really pay to look at everything, because not, not one particular implementation is going to be the silver bullet that makes the quantum computer that changes the world, right? They're all going to have their niche applications that they're going to be good at. And so it's a really good idea to just keep your, uh, keep your eyes and minds open. And so molecules are interesting, and this is my contention. They are interesting for quantum information science um, for a number of fundamental reasons that come down to the basic tenets of chemistry. You can make them cheaply in large quantities. So when you do a reaction and purify a sample in a beaker, you're making something on the order of Avogadro's number, 10 to the 23, or even if you're being modest, 10 to the 20, right, molecules in one go. And by definition in chemistry, when you purify the sample, they are all the same. They have the same properties. They are identical. Um, and, they're, and so they're atomically precise, built from the ground up, in, in, as opposed to constructing something from the top down. Um, and they exist naturally on the nanometer scale. So these are all really good things if you want to do quantum science, right? You know exactly what they are, and they're very tiny. Great. Um, and with chemistry, you can deterministically arrange them completely arbitrarily. And we'll look through quite a lot of examples about how you can do this. Um, but the other really cool thing is you can make them with arbitrary spin architectures. And so that means you can use however many unpaired electrons you want. How do you want them to be coupled? Do you want to have nuclear spins involved? Or do you want to get rid of the nuclear spins? How do you want them arranged? You can do all these really cool things with chemistry that you really can't do with any other branch of, um, of, of those other implementations of, of qubits. So these are all really positive things. And I'm sure we'll get to the negative things later. Or ask me. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about them. OK. So of course, we've heard about electrons. I'm going to do a little bit of background on that. I don't need to labor it too far. Um, but we're going to talk a lot this morning to begin with about magnetic resonance being the primary technique that, with which we interrogate and probe um, molecular spins. OK, so, sing, so unpaired electrons, of course, they have a spin 1 half. Associated with this spin 1 half is a magnetic moment, of course. So we have a gyro gyromagnetic ratio, the ball magneton, and the spin vector, um, which are related to the magnetic moment of the electron. Uh, and back to the quantum mechanics, these, of course, have a, a defined projection of the spin. And these are the two eigenstates of, uh, of some measurement of a spin angular momentum. And as we all know, as we've heard from Wes really nicely on day one, the, the three different possible projections of the spins you could try and measure do not commute. So you cannot have a simultaneous eigenstate of SZ and SX, right, or SZ, or any pair of those. You can only have a defined spin along a single direction. And what this means is that once you make that quantization, um, you don't know any information about the X and the Y components, right? And so the expectation value of those is going to be zero. But of course, if you take an SZ eigenstate and do a measurement of SX, you will get a definite outcome. And it will be one of the eigenstates of SX, right? But the expectation of those measurements will be zero. Um, so that means you only ever know one projection. And so this, and that also tells you that the, the definite projection of the spin onto another axis is also non-zero. It's just that you don't know it simultaneously. So what that tells you is that the spin vector does not point along your quantization axis. It can't, right? It has to have a projection on the other, um, on the other Cartesian directions. And so you get this fundamental cone picture, which you see in every textbook. But that's really why uh, it's there. And so what happens when you apply a magnetic field? Well, you remove the degeneracy between these two spin projections. So here in this conceptual picture, uh, the magnetic field is along the z-axis. And so these two projections of the, the spin vector are no longer degenerate. And their energy is linearly proportional to the external magnetic field. Okay? But because we now have a spin vector that is not aligned along the magnetic field, it can't because it has to have a non-zero projection on x and y, right? Um, we have a, a magnetic moment that is canted with respect to the external magnetic field. And the action then of the magnetic field is to induce a torque on the spin vector. And so the spin processes in this external magnetic field. And this is called precession. Uh, or, and, and the frequency of this precession is given by this expression here. 
Okay, so it's linearly proportional to the magnetic field. Okay, so this is the time dependence of the spin in its external uh, mag magnetic field, in the reference frame of the lab. Okay, and this is also known as uh, La Mole precession. Right. So these pictures come from Gavin Morley uh, at Warwick, and I think single, there's a bunch of these, they're all on Wikipedia, and I think single-handedly these explained everything I needed to know about magnetic resonance. Um, so feel free to, to just stare at this and doze off uh, for a while because they're quite hypnotic. Um, okay, so let's think about the Lamour frequency. So in the lab frame of a spin in a magnetic field, uh, we have a magnetic moment. That's represented by the start of this image here. So here we go, that's our spin. We add a magnetic field and it processes, okay? We can then transform our coordinate system from the lab frame into the rotating frame where the coordinate system is now spinning at the precession frequency, okay? And so that's indicated there by the coordinate system as it starts spinning. And you'll see then in that frame, the spin is static, okay? Uh, and that's really the, the starting point for thinking about magnetic resonance, okay? We're in the rotating frame at the Lamour frequency. And what you can then do is apply an alternating magnetic field to an oscillating field perpendicular to the external magnetic field. So we call this the B1 field. And if you make this oscillating magnetic field oscillate at exactly the Lamour frequency, you can rotate the spin. So in the rotating frame, basically, you can think about that as a magnetic field that's then spinning, right, in the xy plane. Okay, and so now if it's spinning in the xy plane, but in the rotating frame, we're now at the precession frequency, the Lamour frequency, that field becomes static. And so that's indicated by that resonant magnetic field in green, this arrow that will appear here. And so now we can have precession about this extra magnetic field. Okay, and so the precession around this extra external magnetic field is exactly the same expression as the Lamour frequency. And so we call this nutation. And so this is tipping the spin, right? Um, around this uh, oscillating magnetic field. And so application of a continuous wave microwave uh, magnetic field, microwave frequency magnetic field, can interconvert your two spin populations, your eigenstates in your external magnetic field. That's because you can see it spinning from top to bottom. So that's a positive SX, negative, sorry, SZ, positive, negative, okay? So that rotation is interconverting your spin population. So you are, this is the manipulation of a single spin. Okay, so that's what this, this image tries to convey, um, and watch it as many times as you need until it sinks into your head. <laughs> okay, right. The other way of looking at this, of course, is through the, the guise of Hamiltonians and looking at the operator representations of everything that we are doing. So the Zeeman Hamiltonian for a single electron in a magnetic field is deceptively simple. We just have uh, the dot product of the spin vector and the external magnetic field. And in the absence of anything anisotropic, this is rather straightforward. We get this picture, the eigenstates as a function of magnetic field are just linearly dependent on the strength of the field. And the, the picture in our heads here of, of, of um, making an EPR transition is that as we scan the magnetic field and we apply a continuous uh, monochromatic source of microwave radiation, at some point, the energies of our eigenstates will be the correct separation that matches our external oscillating magnetic field such that we can cause this transition to occur. So this is, I guess, the static energy picture of everything. We have a quantum of energy. David Collison, a good friend and colleague of mine at Manchester, loves describing it as a stick. And when that stick matches the gap, you get resonance, okay? So he does exactly that. Um, so that's one way of thinking about it. Of course, from the time-dependent picture that we just saw before, what we know is actually happening is we have a rotating magnetic field, so an oscillating magnetic field in the plane that is matching the Lamour frequency at the correct magnetic field such that you are able to tip the spin, okay? So both pictures are valid ways of thinking about magnetic resonance phenomenon. And so in this picture, we have what's called the resonance condition, and so that is the energy of the microwave quantum h bar omega naught, um, must equal the separation between the two eigenstate energies for a given magnetic field. And the really crucial thing to, to keep in your head here is that the magnetic resonance, it's a resonant technique, right? Which means it doesn't just impact, it doesn't just cause transitions from one eigenstate, the bottom to the top eigenstate, but it causes transitions between the two eigenstates. Okay, so that means you're transferring population both up and down. Okay, so it's a resonant phenomenon. Um, and so the only way you'll ever see anything in an experiment with, in magnetic resonance is if you have a population difference, right? If these, if these two states are exactly the same population to begin with, you will not see any 
absorption of energy because there will be an equal amount of down spin flips as there will be up spin flips. There's nothing special about this. The, you know, the oscillating magnetic field is not asking the spin which way it's pointing, right? Uh, okay, and so you need a population difference if you're going to see anything in a magnetic resonance experiment, uh, and so Boltzmann um, does the job for us quite nicely. Okay, any questions before I move on to kit? Good. So, EPR spectroscopy. You might be familiar with uh, NMR, which is, the, of course, the nuclear spin analog of everything I've just talked about. It, you change the S for an I and the mu B for mu N, and you're good to go, right? There's nothing different about it at all. The, the experimental apparatus for EPR spectroscopy is quite different from that of NMR spectroscopy, and there are many reasons for this, and, and we can talk about those. So the basic, the fundamental components in an EPR spectrometer, you have the source here, the microwave bridge, which is your source and your detector. There are reasons for this. Um, and here we're dealing with microwaves. And that's just the difference between nuclear spins and electron spins is their magnetic moment, right? Being about 1,000 times larger for the electron spin, or maybe 2,000 times, right? On that order of magnitude. And so you need radiation that's at higher energy for a given applied magnetic field. Uh, and so in, in the electron spin world, we are using microwaves. And microwaves are this really annoying part of the spectrum, not quite as annoying as terahertz, but pretty annoying, um, where you have to use waveguides, right, to, to move them around. Um, so that's both a blessing and a curse. But we have these brass waveguides, they're basically just tubes um, that, that pipe the microwave energy from our uh, bridge all the way into the sample, which sits in the middle of an electromagnet. Now, depending on what frequency you are, sometimes uh, it's a, a um, superconducting magnet at higher frequencies, but, but most EPR experiments are done uh, using electromagnets that are less than about two Tesla. Because these are pretty cheap and easy to make, and it's you know, not such a big deal uh, to run them. They don't require cooling and all these things. OK, so this is the, the fundamentals. But we can improve our signal to noise drastically by putting a cavity on the bottom end of this. So a resonant cavity um, that can host a standing wave of the microwave frequency, okay? So we'll go onto frequencies and things in a moment, um, but we're in the gigahertz regime, and that puts our wavelengths on the order of centimeters, okay? Well, for, for X band, and we'll talk about these bands in a moment. And so our cavities are on the orders of centimeters, right, in, in, um, in, diam in, in geometry. And rectangular cavities are a very common one. And so what happens here uh, is this is um, coupled to the microwave source. And so what happens then is as you tune your microwave source, your bridge, to be on resonant with the cavity, there is then an absorption of energy where you set up a standing wave within your cavity that actually travels all the way from the detector down the waveguide and, and sets up in the cavity. And so we have this, when you, when you do the experiment, you are tuning the spectrometer, that's the first thing you do, you observe is what is called the dip. And that is a, a, a drop in reflected microwave power when you're on resonance with the cavity. And the crucial thing you do in the experiment is to what's called critically couple the cavity. And this is making a very high Q factor cavity, if you're familiar with cavity resonance. Um, and that is, you, you can achieve this a number of ways, but the way it's commonly done in EPR is with little iris, which is just a little hole at the top here, which allows you to, um, uh, to, to tune how, mu how much of the microwave power is being coupled into the cavity. And you can do this while manipulating frequency, and there's a whole algorithm to do it, um, but you can get what this, this picture here, this black one, which is very, very sharp um, resonant dip, okay? And so you can have a very precise frequency that has a very, very narrow bandwidth, which is really good if you want to interrogate the fine structure and the spectra um, details of your uh, molecular systems. Okay. Nick, can I ask a question about this? Yes. What does bridge mean? I've never heard that word. This is just, so this is a klystron, right? This is a... a, a klystron? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so this is the, the, the common term they use in the microwave bridge, which, which has the generator and the amplifiers and all the detection circuits as well. So this is just the, the, the word that we use for the entire box that does it. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a microwave engineer. I don't, I've not made these You're things You're way too myself. young to be a microwave engineer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> too much hair, yes. all that kind of stuff. You're too alive. <laughs> Hey, look, we've actually had a lot of PhD students come out of Manchester and go into microwave engineering um, and done very well for themselves. Because, of course, well, actually, we'll get onto history on, another, on the next slide, I think, but there are reasons for this. Uh, okay, so when you put a sample inside the cavity uh, and, the, and the sample is on resonance, that is, it is absorbing some microwave radiation, it detunes the resonator, right? You are putting something in there that's really strongly uh, interacting with your resonant microwave standing mode. 
And so the tuning goes off. And what that does is it reflects more power back to the detector, or back, back to our bridge, right, which is the, both the source and the detector. So when you get this change in reflected power, that's the signal that you are detecting. That's what the EPR signal is. You can actually go a step further and make this even more sensitive by adding what we call modulation coils. And so these are just very, very small electromagnets, so just coils on either side of the, very close to the sample cavity, um, that we modulate at a frequency. And usually this is in the kilohertz region, okay? So there's nothing um, uh, too, too fancy about these electronics. Um, but if we think about what we're doing here, you have a modulating magnetic field. So if this is uh, the absorption line of a, of a resonant microwave um, uh, EPR, Transition, then what you're doing is modulating the x-axis here a little bit, and then you modulate your output, your, your signal, okay? And if you measure this in lock-in with your applied oscillating field, then you get a, a huge leap in sensitivity because you're rejecting any noise that's not on the frequency of your oscillation. So by using modulation and lock-in detection, uh, you get a much higher uh, signal to noise. And the, the other result of that is that you measure the EPR spectrum directly in this way to obtain the first derivative of the absorption. So that's why EPR spectra look like this rather than looking like absorption lines. Now, of course, you can uh, just integrate this and get back your absorption spectrum if you so desire. You can measure an absorption mode. There are other ways to do this, but this is the most common way. Okay. If there are any technical questions about the kit, now is the time to ask them. Otherwise, we can move on. Yes? I had a question on the slide before. Sure. Uh, what happens in the overcouple case? I mean, um, I've never seen this for like, a, I'm thinking about optical fabric row cavities. Okay. And um, I think there have never seen this. So where does the broadening come from? That's or? a very good question. I've not thought about it too deeply. This is where you're admitting far too much power into the cavity. And my only... Um, my only thought is that it, 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 you are not, um, yeah, you're saturating the cavity mode. Um, but as I said, I'm no microwave engineer. I've not really thought about it. I've just been doing this practically and going, yeah, that's, that's not what we want, right? That's a, a, a much broader cue. I mean, overcoupling actually has a, um, has a benefit because you can, as you can see, right, it's a broader band. And so you, you have a larger bandwidth then to play with of modes that are supported in your cavity. Um, and that's useful when we talk about pulse DPR down the line. Um, but in terms of the actual physics of what's going on with the, the cavity, I, yeah, that's a good question. I've not thought about it deeply. Yeah, that's homework for me. Thanks. Uh, I have a question about the numbers. Like, uh, so you are dealing with how many frequencies and how many Teslas? Okay, frequencies and Teslas. We'll get on. I think that's on the next slide. Okay, cool. So, um, so the development of EPR really happened. So EPR was developed before NMR. Um, you know, that's the claim to fame, even though NMR is vastly more popular and, you know, changed the world and all these things. Um, EPR was the, the original one. Um, and really, this all, the development happened uh, very intensely after the Second World War, and it just turned out that there was stacks of 9.4 gigahertz um, microwave equipment lying around. Um, it had a lot to do with the development of radar, basically, um, back in, in those days. Uh, and so this is the frequency, really, that EPR developed around. So 9.4 gigahertz... Uh, is about 0.3 wave numbers, if that's your jam. I don't know how many MEVs that is. Multiply by eight. Sorry, divide by eight. So some fractions of MEVs. Very, very small quanta of energy here, right? Um, and at, for G, G equals two, and so for the free electron, it's 2.0023 dot, 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 dot. Um, the resonant frequency uh, at 9.4 gigahertz, the field required is about 330 millitesla, okay? Or, or, um, or 0.3 0.3 Tesla. So it's not very big. So you can easily achieve this in a lab using an electromagnet, which is another reason why this is really convenient frequency if you want to study uh, the resonance of electrons because you don't need superconductors or anything like that. Okay? Um, unlike NMR where you're doing other things. Okay. So that, does that answer your question about energies? Good. Um, and when we have a critically coupled resonator, the CW bandwidth is tiny. We're talking megahertz on the gigahertz line. Okay, so you've got a very, very sharp monochromatic uh, microwave source uh, that you can um, achieve. We don't just run at X band. Um, the other common frequencies are Q band, so that's at around 34 gigahertz. There's also K band in the middle, 24. Um, w band is another popular one at 94 gigahertz, and these all use resonant cavities. So, of course, as you increase the uh, frequency, you are decreasing the wavelength. So, by the time you're at W band, 
your cavity is itty bitty bitty tiny thing. And so you're putting your sample, so if, you, if, if anyone's done NMR, the, so that's like a five, five millimeter OD tube, um, X-band is pretty similar to that, right? You're talking about a half a centimeter or something like that um, for the sample size. When you get to W-band, it's like a capillary, like I don't, thinner than, thinner than a wire. It's, it's a pain, it's a real pain. Um, so W-band is difficult. And you can do EPR above this, up to the hundreds of gigahertz, but here you're using very different. You're not using resonant cavities anymore, you're using free space, quasi-optics, and all kinds of crazy stuff. And if you, then when you get into the real terahertz, then everything is completely different. You're doing time domain spectroscopy and the uh, Right, so we're not gonna go into that because that's really not my bag. Um, but it is possible to do this at very different frequencies. And you can do also frequency swept EPR, but again, that's a whole different kettle of fish. Okay. So here's just some pictures of kit before we move on to uh, what you can do with this. Uh, so this is a, an X-band. So these are all Brooker instruments. Again, they hold the monopoly as they do in uh, NMR. Um, this up there is your bridge. There you have a waveguide that goes down to your sample. Your sample cavity is in there. Looks something like this. That's a rectangular uh, continuous wave X-band resonator. Here is your electromagnets on either side. Um, there's a dewer of nitrogen for cooling your sample if you want to do nitrogen temperatures. Uh, this is a W-band resonator. This does use a superconducting magnet because G2 at W-band is something up in the, uh, my seven Teslas or something like this from memory. Um, and so you have to have a superconducting magnet to do this. That's your bridge and this is your console, which is all the electronics. Um, resonator, so that's our continuous wave X-band resonator. So you set up a standing mode in here. Q-band pulse, so again, we're at Q-band, higher frequency, smaller wavelength, which means we have a smaller resonator. Um, this also has a different geometry because it's designed for pulsed EPR, and we'll talk about that next. Okay, this, this Brooker thing on the left, what's the price? Uh, whoa, I haven't bought one in a long time. Um, last we were quoting, you're talking in the half mil to mil pounds region, so I don't know what that puts that in US dollary dues. Something. It's not that far off, I think, at the moment. Anyway. But these are not going to break the earth. These are not like, you know, Wes's laser systems that are going to take a few kidneys to get brand new off the shelf. Um, but also, these, so we actually got rid of this. This is in Manchester. We got rid of this. And perversely, the laws are really painful. And we couldn't give this away because it, the university would become liable for blah, 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 blah. You know, lawyers. Ugh, oh, painful. Anyway, so that thing had a sad demise. And I don't think anyone's using it anymore, which is, which is a crying shame. Where, where is the microwave bridge? Sorry? Where is the microwave? Oh, the microwave yeah. bridge is that box on the top there and this box here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You don't need cryogenics for that, job. Well, I mean, so it depends what you want to do. So X-band, you just need an a, um, electromagnet, right? So that's fine. You don't need cryogenics for that. You have a water cooling, right? Because you're putting some current through a coil. You need some cooling. Um, if your sample, we'll talk about samples later, but if you, when you, lots of the spin physics we care about, you need, you know, a handful of Kelvin at the most. Uh, and so you will need some kind of cooling there for the sample. Um, usually uh, EPR uses liquid helium. So conventionally it's a big dewer and you pipe it in. You can also run these with cryostats that are you know, pulse tube coolers that don't require liquid cryogens and things. Yeah. But of course, if you're using uh, Supercon, then you need you know, helium, nitrogen, jackets, the whole thing. Yeah. Okay. Cool, so this is a, a sort of a bit more about the resonator. So in the standard rectangular cavities, which is, this is a lovely illustration courtesy of Eric, I think, um, we have th the standing mode that we are exciting. I think it's called TE001 or something like this. Again, I'm not a microwave engineer. Um, but this is called perpendicular mode. And this particular mode enhances the magnetic field lines at the sample and minimizes the electric field. Because of course, what do you do with microwaves in your life that isn't EPR spectroscopy? There are right and wrong answers for this. Does anyone use a microwave in their life to do something that is not EPR spectroscopy? <laughs> yes, thank you. Someone owns a microwave oven. Yeah, you heat your food, right? And the reason you heat your food is because microwaves, as we heard, was it, I think it was Nick's talk, right, Nick Hutzler. He was talking about all the different energy scales. Gigahertz, yeah, that's molecular rotations, okay? So that's how you heat your food. You jiggle the water, it spins around, heats things up, okay? So microwave heating is a real thing, and that works by using the electric dipole of the molecules that actually do have permanent dipole moments, and I will die on that hill, 
Um, in the condensed phase, they are real. They are there, yes. Um, uh, and you spin them around, right? And so that's what happens with the electric field. And we don't really want to do that for our samples. We don't want to cook them. We're there to do spectroscopy. So we want magnetic dipole transitions. And so this mode enhances the microwave magnetic field and minimizes the electric field at the sample, OK? And so our Hamiltonian becomes uh, a static external magnetic field, Bz. I've just said B0 along Z here. Uh, and then we have a perpendicular microwave magnetic field. And, and I've just written the x component. There is a y component. Let's not worry. And this oscillates at some frequency that we fix. And so if we treat our oscillating field with time-dependent perturbation theory, so this is first order um, uh, time-dependent perturbation, we have Fermi's golden rule, which gives us a transition probability or intensity that is proportional to the absolute square of the matrix element of the oscillating magnetic field between our two eigenstates. Okay, if that bit's unclear, um, go do some homework. That is a really, really nice bit of derivation, um, how you go from this to this. That's really fun. OK, but what this leads to, of course, is if we have this oscillating SX term in our Hamiltonian, you can rewrite that as a, as a raising and lowering pair, which we've heard nicely from Wes already. Uh, and that gives us our dipole magnetic selection rule, which is delta rem s equals plus or minus 1. So that's where this comes from. So this is the EPR selection rule that we care about uh, in our spectroscopy. Right. OK, so g equals roughly 2. Um, when g does not equal 2, that's where the fun stuff happens in EPR. Uh, and when g does not equal 2, that tells you you have something to do with an orbital component. Because free spins, right, if they're perfectly free spins not in interacting with anything, will be g equals 2.0023, fine structure constant, blah, blah, blah. But we have spin-orbit coupling in reality, and so any orbital degree of freedom can couple to the spin and deviate from g equals 2. But to have any serious orbital angular momentum, you need orbital degeneracy. And we're going to talk about this in a bit of detail. But organic compounds, so, so uh, single unpaired electrons in organic molecules that don't have degenerate um, orbitals, will give you g values that are very, very close to the free electron. Okay? Um, but for metal complexes where you do have a whole bunch of metal, uh, degenerate orbitals, or possibly near degenerate orbitals, you can have significant deviations. So we'll talk a lot about D1 and D9 complexes, because these are practically, for all intents and purposes, single unpaired electrons. But these still give you deviations significantly, measurably, from 2. Uh, and these are second order effects. We'll talk about that. When you get to something like the F block, where you get crazy degenerate F orbitals, and you can have crazy anisotropy, we can also talk about that. And that comes from a first order effect versus a second order effect. OK. So question. Do you measure, like, actually G? in your lab, or do you use like the tables that are there? Well, you measure the magnetic field at which you have a, a transition. And you know very precisely your microwave frequency. So we have a frequency counter. Uh, and so from if you know the material you're investigating, say, to spin 1 half, you can use the resonant um, condition right, to determine what g is. So you don't, you don't get a readout that says, hey, g is. But it depends on a model, right? Because when you're dealing with lanthanides, you have a whole different interpretation of what the spectrum means. So basically, you're measuring the resonant frequency. Correct. Yeah. You're measuring the absorption of microwave power at a fixed frequency as you sweep a magnetic field. And using a model, you can try and understand what that means in terms of spin physics. So spin-orbit coupling doesn't just change g. It makes it anisotropic. And so in general, gx does not equal gy, does not equal gz. Um, and, these could be in, and these are in the molecular frame that we're talking about here. Uh, and so in fluid solution, if you have uh, tumbling right, over the time scale of your measurement, and the time scale of an EPR measurement is quite long. These are not, so we haven't got into pulse yet. Oh my, I'm going to run out of time. Anyway, that's fine. Um, uh, right, in fluid solution, you have tumbling, and so you average out all your anisotropies. Right? So this is the common case for NMR spectroscopy. If you've done that, you get single lines. You measure a chemical shift. That's the isotropic chemical shift. If you do solid state NMR, I pity you. That's a really terrible experiment. But when you, when you have fluids, it's all nice. OK, EPR. And EPR is far easier to do in solids than NMR is, right? And it's really, really a benefit for us. So when you freeze your sample, if it's a solution, or you take a solid and you dunk it in a tube, you do not average out your anisotropy anymore. You measure the simultaneous uh, response of the entire sample, right? So you are essentially integrating over magnetic field directions if you think about a single molecule. Or you have a static field and you're spinning your molecule around, right? 
and you're seeing all of the responses. Okay, and so you see a component from a signal from every component in your um, in your sample. And so let's consider here uh, an axially symmetric complex. So this is a copper compound, square planar copper compound with four ligands. If you're not a chemist, these wedged bonds mean they're coming out of the plane. The dotty ones mean they're going back into the plane. And we have an axis of symmetry, which I'm calling Z along there. Okay. And so in this case, when you have an axially symmetric compound, GX, which is in the plane, is equal to GY, because we have symmetry in the plane. That's got a four-fold rotation axis as well as mirror and all that symmetry. Um, but it's different from this axial direction, okay? So we have two unique G values. And in this particular example, GZ is larger than GX and GY. And so as a function of magnetic field for a fixed frequency, we will get a, a, a kick up in absorption at the earliest possible magnetic field that makes resonance, okay? So think about going along the Z direction with magnetic field. So if I have energy and I have BZ, right, well, I'll just have B, then along the Z direction, right, we might have a splitting like that. So that's Z. Okay, but along the X and Y directions, which have a smaller G value, right, their Zeeman term, remember G sits in the Zeeman term, and your splitting is, your, your eigenstate energies are linearly proportional to G and B. If G is smaller, your splitting is smaller, right? So that's what's happening along the X, Y direction. And so for the resonant condition to happen, it happens at a certain magnetic field for your Z direction, but then it's going to have to take a bit longer before we get something that fits this stick out here, okay? And so you start getting absorption at the Z line, in this case, because Z is the larger G value, and it continues to absorb, because as we rotate the molecule in the magnetic field, our G value is going to be somewhere between the Z and the XY, yeah? And so you keep getting absorption until you then get this peak, which is at your GX equals GY, and that's the smallest G value you have, right? And there's nothing in your sample that has a smaller G value than that. And so you stop getting resonance. And so then the absorption drops. Now that's the absorption spectrum. We directly measure the first derivative. And so that looks like a bump, nothing, and then this big dip like that, okay? So that's the characteristic spectrum of an axially symmetric uh, spin one half uh, signal, okay? General profiles. So if you have an isotropic signal, you just get one line, right? That's just something like a Gaussian or a Lorentzian, and you take the first derivative and you get something that looks like that. Okay, so that's, a, that's the standard isotropic EPR spectrum. And if you have high symmetry compounds, so octahedral or tetrahedral, you'll get something like that. If you then have an axially anisotropic uh, compound or, or, or G values, you will have this one we just saw, but you can also have the reverse, right? Where your GX and GY is larger than GZ. And that just gives you the inverse. So in absorption space, uh, that would look something like this, right? And so if you take the first derivative of that, you get the uh, second spectrum here. And so that happens in, in axial symmetry groups. As you go to lower symmetry groups, you get what's called a rhombic spectrum, where GX does not equal GY, does not equal GZ. And that thing in absorption space looks something like this, okay? And you take the first derivative of that, and you get this guy, okay? Yes? Because if these spectrums are taken uh, in a single, with a single direction of the magnetic field and the, uh, the microwave? Or? So in the lab frame, we have a single uh, direction of magnetic field. We have one electromagnet that's conventionally horizontal, <laughs> like this. Um, and the microwaves are coming down from the resonant, from the, the bridge into the cavity. And the standing mode that you set up has a perpendicular magnetic field of the oscillating um, component, right? So that means it's that way and this way, okay? Uh, and so those are fixed, but remember what's varying here is these are immobilized samples. So either a frozen solution or a solid, which has every possible orientation of the molecule. You do actually need to be careful when you're doing the experiment on a powder because you, the external magnetic field can align your samples. The, the, you know, they will exert a torque on the crystallites, and so you can align your spectra, and that's a whole other thing. Um, but yes, does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Okay. Okay. So, pulsed EPR, how do we manipulate spins? Um, there's a really good primer from, um, from Brooker. That's, I just found that on the web, um, which is really good if you want to, to look that up. These slides will go up on the, on the shared drive. I just was adding slides this morning, so I haven't done that yet. Um, good. So let's return to this picture. 
Now, the precession frequency that we talked about there, or the nutation frequency, is also called the Rabi frequency. So you can, this is Rabi flops, basically, in, in quantum information uh, speak. Okay, so that's the same picture we saw before. Now, if we start talking about doing a pulse of, mic of resonant microwave radiation, then we'll be tipping the spin by a certain angle that is related to the duration of the pulse and the, the, the nutation frequency, okay? And the nutation frequency of, is, of course, dependent on the strength of the microwave magnetic field, which is the power of microwaves that we're putting in here. So, our, so EPR is always discussed and thought about in using the microwaves as a classical magnetic field rather than talking about photons. Um, so we always talk about the intensity of the microwaves in the classical oscillating wave picture and standing waves in the cavity and all of that, okay? Um, so we're going to be tipping our spin via a particular angle theta dependent on the pulse length and power. And so if we want to achieve a pi half rotation, then the time of the pulse we need is given by that expression there. And so, of course, you can write this out for whatever pulse tipping angle you want. Okay, so there's nothing different from the, 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 the stuff that Wes was talking about, but this is how it's implemented in EPR. Okay. So now what we're doing is we're applying a finite duration of microwave radiation at a fixed frequency. But because it's time dependent, of course, you're going to have some bandwidth. So if you take a square pulse and you do a Fourier transform, right, then you get the frequency content of your pulse. The longer the pulse is, the more monochromatic it is, right? There's less edges if you think about it like this. Okay. The shorter the pulse, the more broadband it is okay, because the frequency is less defined, basically. So the bandwidth is related to the duration, okay? And often we talk about the bandwidth in EPR pulses as the, the sort of central part of the sinc squared function. And so for a 10 nanosecond pulse, we can think about this width being around about 200 megahertz, or for a pulse at, at V naught, uh, we'll have plus or minus 100 megahertz on either side, okay? So this is the, the bandwidth of a pulse in EPR. Now, this is incredibly different to NMR, right? Because in NMR, you're in the microwave, sorry, you're in the, in the um, megahertz regime of frequencies, and your pulses, because you're trying to tip, you're attempting to tip nuclear spins, right? Which have much smaller magnetic moments by about a factor of a thousand, which means you need pulse durations that are longer by about a factor of a thousand. So instead of doing nanosecond pulses, you're doing microsecond pulses. And when you're doing microsecond pulses, that means your bandwidth is um, small, vastly smaller. But that's okay, because it, remember, you're measuring NMR shifts on the PPM, so parts per million scale in the megahertz band, which means your NMR spectrum has a width of something on the order of, I don't know, tens, maybe hundreds of hertz. It's not, it's not big, right? And so even a, a microsecond pulse of radio wave frequency can in cover the entire bandwidth of your um, NMR spectrum. So you can flip the entire thing at the same time. Whereas with an EPR uh, experiment, your bandwidth is vastly smaller usually, than your spectral width. So I'll hit that on the next slide, I think. Yeah, OK, so here's an example. So in EPR, if we're dealing with an ensemble of molecules with anisotropy, so here we have a spin 1 half with uh, three different g values, OK? So here's the absorption spectrum, and here's the corresponding derivative spectrum, OK? So as a function of magnetic field, we get absorption from the highest g value first, then it goes into the plane, and then we have the smallest g value, OK? Take the derivative, and that's what you get. We can also recast this in frequency space. So looking at a fixed magnetic field. So this is at a fixed microwave frequency and we're scanning the field, which is the experiment. But of course, we know from our spin physics that you could do the reverse. If you had access to that, you could do a fixed magnetic field and scan the frequency, right? So the frequency space spectrum, and this is from Stefan Stoll's uh, lectures. Um, it's just a really nice picture. Um, so this is the frequency space spectrum of the same spin system. So now, of course, we're at the reverse. So the whole thing is flipped around, right? If I go back a slide, that's the absorption spectrum. We get the small bump, big bump, and long one. It's flipped around, OK? And the reason for that is we're now in frequency space at a fixed magnetic field. So at very small frequencies, or correspondingly so, you get the, uh, is the small g value, right? Because we're talking about smaller frequencies down here absorbing first. Then at the largest g value, you have the larger frequencies. OK, so now if we're having a pulse of microwave radiation at, say, 9.5 gigahertz, that's only 100 megahertz wide, we're taking a very small slice out of this spectrum. So if you're going to manipulate electron spins with EPR, that's the first problem, is that you better have a tiny bandwidth of, of your sample, 
or a very, very large bandwidth of your pulse. And that's hard to achieve because if you want to achieve, say, a pi pulse and you want to have a larger bandwidth, that means you need to make it shorter. And 100 megahertz is already a 10 nanosecond pulse. So you're going to be talking very few nanoseconds if you want to be getting wider than that. And there is going to be a limit, of course, dictated by power that you can actually achieve to get there to make the turning angle you need. OK. And so this primarily occurs because not all spins have the same precession frequency at a given magnetic field. OK. And the other point to make here is that this implies, when you're doing a pulse DPR spectrum, that you are selecting for specific orientations, a subset of orientations in your sample. right? So at a fixed magnetic field, when you do a pulse at a fixed frequency, your bandwidth is such that you are only taking a slice out of this anisotropic spectrum. So a lot of your sample is not on resonance with the experiment that you're doing. You're only looking at the molecules that have a specific orientation in the external magnetic field that are on resonance with the microwave pulse that you're applying. Okay? There are lots of ways you can visualize this. We can talk about it if anyone's interested. OK, so now let's actually talk about what happens in pulse DPR experiments. Because, of course, we aren't directly manipulating the spins. That's not what we do in magnetic resonance. We do not have access to the individual spins. What we have access to is the net magnetization of the sample. So in the magnetic field, when you split your, your energy levels at any finite temperature, the Boltzmann distribution tells you there's more molecules that are going to be in the lower energy state than there are in the higher energy state, right? which means you have a preference, which means you have a net magnetization in a given direction. And so along the external magnetic field, let's call it B0 along Z, we have developed a net magnetization. And of course, all the individual spins, they're processing and they're pointing in different directions, right? But their Z components are, well, for the ones that don't cancel out, are all in the same direction, OK? That's the reason we have this magnetization vector now pointed up. So this looks a lot like the block sphere. But it's not the block sphere quite, because we're talking about magnetization, not a spin vector. Because we're not talking, so this is not the ket, right? This is the actual physical magnetization of the sample. Right, so in a static magnetic field, we have a definite mz pointing along bz or b0. Okay? As we apply a pi a over 2 pulse, say, Okay, around the positive x direction, we can rotate the magnetization of the entire sample, or at least the sample that's on resonance with our microwaves, into the xy plane. Convention says we put it to the minus y. Okay, so that's our pi half pulse. Then what's going to happen? What do people think is going to happen once we put, a, put the magnetization into the xy plane? Whirly birds? Yeah, it'll process, exactly. So it processes, okay? And so M will now process around the external magnetic field at the Lamore frequency. And what you can do then is measure this oscillating signal. Okay? So this essentially generates an oscillating magnetic field that can be received um, at the detector. The problem is, well, sorry, what then happens, of course, is that not all molecules have the same precession frequency. Even within the bandwidth, the narrow bandwidth that you've hit, the few hundred megahertz, there is a distribution of precession frequencies. And so in the rotating frame, so this is all in the rotating frame, the spins will fan out. The one that stays in the center is the one that's exactly on resonance with your microwave pulse. But the ones that are a little bit slower or a little bit faster in the rotating frame fan out. OK? So that's what this graphic indicates. And this is called the free induction decay. And so you get this pulse of, after, you hit, uh, after you've turned your spins into the plane, you get this pulse of, of um, processing microwave uh, radiation, which then decays due to this dephasing. Right. Now, if you want to excite all of the spins or more of the spins, you need a large bandwidth, which means you need a shorter pulse, which means you need more power. OK, so those are the things we talked about before. The consequence of this is that when you're doing these things with a lot of power, you're detect you need to put a lot of amplifying power of the microwaves in to make these things happen. And the det detection circuits are very sensitive. And you can't measure the, uh, the free induction decay during this period. So this is called the dead time. And a number of things are happening at this point in time. The amplifier doesn't have an infinitely sharp cutoff for amplifying a microwave um, signal. The detectors don't have an immediate um, discrimination time where they can turn on and, and measure this microwatts of, of, of microwave power compared to kilowatts that you're applying to do the pulse. 
you also have a resonant cavity, which, you know, just like a tuning fork, if you smack it really hard, it's going to ring for a while. So the cavity has a ring down time. And so all of this contributes to the dead time where we cannot measure uh, usually the FID, unless you do very long pulses and then your FID lives for a very long time. And not, eh. Anyway, but we don't want to do that. We want to do short pulses, high power to tip as much of the sample, as, uh, the, the magnetization as we can. Okay, so instead we use spin echoes. And the Hahn echo sequence, I was surprised Wes didn't talk about this, but that's fine, we can talk about it. So the Hahn echo sequence is, is not unique to, to EPR, um, but it is a beautiful demonstration. So instead of measuring the FID, we want to measure a spin echo. Okay, so this is the Hahn echo. So we start with a magnetization along Z. We apply a pi over two pulse, which rotates the magnetization into the XY plane. We will then have the free induction decay as the spins dephase in the plane because they all have slightly different precession frequencies. If after a time tau, we then apply a pi pulse, we flip all of those spins onto the other side of the hemisphere. But because we haven't changed the direction of the external magnetic field, their precession directions don't change. So the ones that were going away at the start, we flip them over, my dancing is not so great, and then they come back together, right? Because they process in the same direction. So the ones that were going faster on this side now come back towards the center. And so we have a refocusing here of the magnetization in the opposite direction. And this is the spin echo, because this then, so the same time we let them dephase here, tau, and then we issue a pulse, it will take them the same time to refocus. And so after two tau, we get an echo. This is the, the two pulse Hahn echo sequence, the most basic spin echo. There are so many different echoes you can do, refocusing stimulated, it's a lot of fun. And again, I don't design pulse sequences, this is not my bag. Um, this is all about NMR. NMR does this all the time. Um, like all the fancy, cozy, dozy, blah, blah, whatever, pick your acronyms. Um, it's all pulse sequences like this, okay? So that's really fun. So the pulse, the, this pulse sequence will refocus in homogeneities in your sample. That is things that have slightly different frequencies and all that. But it does not refocus decoherences. So any spin, because remember, we're talking about magnetization here. But of course, the magnetization comes from the spins. So any spin that you've tipped and decides, and it wanders off and does something else, and it loses phase coherence, it's no longer processing um, uh, in a unitary manner, uh, according to these, or it's not um, evolving in a unitary manner under these pulse sequences in this time, does not get refocused. So it disappears, right? So the longer you wait when you do this, the less signal you get back. Okay? And so this gives you a mechanism for measuring the, the phase memory time. So I like calling it TM, the phase memory time. Some people call it T2 star. Some people will call it T2. And some people will have arguments about that. I'm not here for that. If you want to have an argument about the merits of different... I'm going to go through lots of examples as well. You will see TM, you will see T2. Don't get in a, in a knot, okay? <laughs> it's just, it's a Hahn echo sequence. It's the echo, um, the time scale of the echo decay. Right, so here is another lovely animation from uh, Gavin Morley, which is the Hahn echo sequence. So let's, so you've seen it once, and let's just go through it again. So we're going to tip our magnetization into the XY plane, first pulse, dephases, we flip it by a pi pulse, comes back together, refocuses, gives you an echo. And as you make that time longer, the echo decreases. There you go. This is all you need to know about pulse DPR. So this is, this is on Wikipedia, so you can go and just look that up. Um, and so we can measure this intensity of the, uh, the Hahn echo sequence as a function of time, 2 tau, uh, and then we get, uh, we can fit that with an exponential decay uh, and, and obtain our phase memory time. Of course, people use often stretched exponentials, and the stretching factor tells you something about the decay mechanisms and rah, 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 rah. Again, I'm not here for that. Cool. So a question, a question is that why is the, uh, maybe all, all of the, the directions of the spins do not... Uh, change after you create such an echo. They just the decays in one, uh, one direction, but they do not disperse again, like, like in the green lines there. Uh, so is your question, why do they go, why are they traveling in the reverse direction? Is that uh, the question? Um, they're trying to reverse, and then they just go to the directions, and then they decay, but they, they, they do, so this graphic is this graphic is just a you know a cartoon representation. Of course, what happens as a function of time is the spins come, they make an echo, and then they keep going past. They still keep going past. Yes. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is just an, you know this is saying okay and stop it, freeze frame, and now pretend we've run this experiment at different times. Okay. 
That's, that's what this cartoon is showing you. In reality, you flip the spins with the pi pulse, they come past, make an echo, and they keep going. Um, so, so that in the timeline, the uh, different spins uh, only go to one direction, maybe instantly, and then they, in, uh, in reality, they should still disperse. Yeah. They, they will keep the, going. After the echo change. Correct. After, the, after the echo. That's why the echo drops, right? That's why the echo envelope is something like this. It goes up and down, because once they form the echo, they keep going past, okay, and they keep processing and dispersing. And then, okay. You, yeah. Okay, great. Yes. Two questions. Well, first of all, I come from superconducting qubit design, so they use a lot of T2 echo and T2 Ramsey. Do you have numbers for this one? Com just to compare. Time scales? Yeah. Just be patient. We're going to get there. And second of all, like what happens, like also another problem in superconducting qubits is that these pulses are not perfect. Like you can actually oh, yeah. perhaps. Oh, yeah. In here, how you actually collect that. We can talk about that. Um, this is all, I've only talked about rectangular pulses. You can do fun shaped pulses, Gaussian pulses. You can do all kinds of things. These days, then this is only in the last, say, maybe 10 years for the, for the oldest people and maybe a few years for the people who've catch, caught up. Um, all of these spectrometers are equipped with AWGs, so you can do whatever you want. Um, but you're right, the, the, the quality of your amplification of those pulses and upscaling frequency and all these things will give you sort of janky signals and they're not perfect. And There's a lot more problems than that, though. That's not the biggest problem we have here, okay? <laughs> we'll, we'll get there. Right. Okay, so another very basic experiment um, is trying to measure the T1 timescale, the spin lattice. So this is called an inversion recovery experiment. And so again, we'll start with our M pointing along Z, the magnetic field. This time we're going to apply a pi pulse. And so that flips the magnetization downwards, okay? So this is a population inversion. If we think about having more spins here in our Z state to start with, right, then we do up here and we do a pi pulse, we are just inverting those populations so that we end up having more population in our top eigenstate than we do in our bottom one. And so we've just flipped the orientation of the net magnetization. So that's a pi pulse. Um, it's obviously then static in the external field if the pulse is done correctly. Like, yeah, yes, there are problems with that. Um, if we then wait some time tau, that will decay because, of course, this is now an out of equilibrium population. And so on the time scale of T1, interaction with the bath, the spins will start equilibrating and going back to their preferred populations. Okay? And so, so the net magnetization along this negative Z direction will decrease. And in order to measure how much that's decreased, we can perform a high echo sequence. So we take our negative magnetization, we flip it with a pi half pulse. Now we flip around and we're in the positive Z, uh, sorry, positive Y direction. We can then do our, let it dephase and perform our uh, pi pulse. We flip it, we get an echo on the positive Y. And so we now we have a, um, another echo here. And if you do this as a function of this time scale here, which is how long you're waiting with it, uh, after the first pi pulse, as a function of time, you can measure this inversion recovery. So we're inverting the spin, and we're seeing how long it's taking for the spins to recover. Okay? So that's this experiment here, and it gives you uh, the time scale T1. Okay. Right. Of course, you don't have to do pulses like this. You can do them however you want. And so the simplest demonstration of coherent control uh, of an electron spin but of course here we're dealing with an ensemble of electron spins, so we're coherently manipulating the net magnetization, not individual electron spins. This is Wes's point on slide two or something of his talk. Um, right, and that's a nutation experiment. So this is where we start in our uh, Z net magnetization, and we apply some pulse here that rotates our uh, magnetization by some angle theta, uh, and then we do a Han echo sequence to see how much we've rotated, okay? And so if you do this experiment, of course, then you will uh, do your Han echo by, by rotating this magnetization vector down there somewhere by pi one half, wait some time for it de to dephase, flip it again, come back and get an echo. And if you do this for different pulse lengths of, of or powers here for this first pulse, of course, you'll see an oscillating precession, or not precession, sorry, mutation of the spin. And so this is exactly like we've seen in previous uh, uh, talks, um, this lovely oscillating uh, re response here. Okay, but of course, that's not reality. How big is the ensemble? Yep. Well, that's not an easy question to answer because it depends on what it is, right? If you're doing X-band, you've got a sample that's maybe, I don't know, 
so big, you know, macroscopic, but you're only addressing a fraction of the spins with your resonant microwave frequency, depending on the, band, the frequency bandwidth of the sample and the bandwidth of your pulse and the bandwidth of your resonator and the power of it. So it's not an easy question. But it is a macroscopic, you know, number of spins. Okay, but this is not, of course, reality. Something like this is reality. This is a real experiment, and we'll get to this one later. But of course, if you drive in mutations, you can do it. It's coherent, it's beautiful, but it decays, right? And we're gonna talk about why that is, what that is, how to make it better, all these things. Oh, goodness, right. Okay, so what causes decoherence for molecular spins and how do we fix it? So, nearby electron spins. That's gonna be a big problem. So you can perform experiments on very dilute solutions, and this is less than millimolar concentrations if you're a chemist out there. Um, so that's very possible to do. The downside, of course, is you have a distribution of molecular geometries in an ensemble of, of, of frozen solution, and you have no control over the orientation of your molecules. So if you want to do something very specific, that's not great. The other way to do it is if you can make a compound that is the diamagnetic analog. So here we're talking about paramagnetic samples with unpaired electrons. If you can make the same material that doesn't have the unpaired electron, then you're onto a winner, and you can dope a little bit of your paramagnetic species into a molecular crystal that is the diamagnetic analog. And so then you can, if you can do this, you can then have a, a crystalline that has oriented molecules with a well-known geometry, well-known properties, and you can do your experiments on definite orientations. The downside, of course, is that's not always possible to do, or it's very, very hard. Okay, nearby nuclear spins, they can also cause uh, decoherence. And so protons are everywhere, and protons suck if you are doing electron spin resonance. Um, and so you can, if you can isotopically enrich your sample with deuterium, then you can change the Lamour frequency of your spins into a regime that's not so problematic, and that helps. The downside is that's expensive and difficult. There are deuteration facilities around the world because if anyone's doing neutron scattering experiments, protons suck, and so you want to deuterate everything, but that's very time consuming and expensive. Um, or you can design compounds, ligands, that have no, or to a very good approximation, no nuclear spins. So things like carbon, oxygen, silicon, and sulfur are pretty good because they have very low natural abundances of spins. Yes, of course, you could isotopically enrich everything and know what you're doing, like the beautiful experiments we have you know, in labs here. Um, you don't do that for bulk chemistry. That's expensive. Yeah. Good. OK. So I have a whole bunch of examples, and we can talk about merits and pros and cons and fun things. And I'd love to hear any uh, examples you have of your own or any questions you have about these ones. So it, it, on paper, any spin 1 half molecule can be a qubit. It doesn't have to be fancy, right? Uh, so for instance, organic radicals, trital. So you could have anything, any carbon atom with three bonds to it, any chemist, probably physicist, maybe I'm being a bit rude, um, knows that carbon has four valence electrons, so you make three bonds to it, it shares three of those valence electrons, one is left over, okay? So any, any um, triply valent carbon will have an unpaired electron, if it's neutral. Uh, okay, and so we have a radical, and there are far simpler ones than trital, but this is a lovely one, and you can see this has got a really big, bulky thing on the back. And that's because if you have an unpaired electron on a carbon, it wants to do chemistry. It doesn't want to hang around for very long. But you can protect it by making it really big and bulky. And so this is lovely work from the Eatons many, many, many years ago. This is a lovely uh, review of their work. Okay, so you can make lots of variants of these things, and you can measure its, um, uh, these T1 and, and Tm timescales. So this is a bit of a weird plot. So this is log temperature versus log rates. Um, okay, so here is your T1. So as you are cooling things down, your T1 is, your, your rate is getting slower. Uh, and as a function of temperature, this is your Tm. There's some weird stuff here, and that's because this is done in solution. And this is getting up to around, oh, there's 300 Kelvin, right? And so this thing here, I think this is in, it's probably in THF. Oh, no, there you go, water glycerol. Uh, and so this is a part where your solution is not quite frozen and not quite, you know, fluid. It's a bit weird. And so the dynamics, the spin dynamics get really weird because your rotate, molecular rotations start to become important as well. And that's on a similar frequency time scale, right? So it's a bit of a problem. But as you go below that and it's frozen and immobilized, you see you have this nice flat thing here. So this is on the order of 10 to the, uh, 10 to the 5 per second. So 10 to the minus 5 seconds, okay? 
So that's for organic radicals. And this is primarily limited by uh, nuclear spin diffusion, so all the flip-flops in your environment um, killing your spin. Okay. What are other examples? Well, you can use 3D1 compounds. So this is vanadium-4. This is out of Dana Friedman's group. Uh, and so this is a nice ligand. So this is carbon-8, sulfur-8. You can see this compound here. And you've got three of those. So this has no protons in its environment. Um, this is a dianion, so there's going to be a cation somewhere. And presumably these, these experiments are in solution. I can't remember what solution they've used. But here we go. These are Harnecko experiments. Oh, there are the different solutions there. Okay, and so you can see here, the t so she calls it T2. So get your claws out. Um, anyway, this is a Harnecko experiment as a function of temperature, and we then have something on the order of microseconds. So this is one microsecond if you're in dimethyl form oxide or in toluene or things like this. Not very much change, but if you go to CS2, which is a terrible compound, it's not a very nice thing to work with, but it's lovely if you're doing spin physics in solution because it doesn't have nuclear spins, or at least most of it, 99 point whatever percent of it, doesn't have nuclear spins. And so as you cool down, look at that. Oh, wow. So that's 1,000 microseconds, okay? So a millisecond. Not bad. Not bad for a molecule, right? That's plenty enough to do anything in the quantum information domain because our pulses are on the order of nanoseconds, okay? So perfect, great. And yes, look, you can do coherent... Rabi oscillations with these things, okay, or mutations. And so here, just a graphical illustration of rotating the magnetization. And you can see here as well, the, in the inset, the uh, spin flip time, or related to the frequency, uh, is proportional linearly to the strength of the magnetic field, okay? So that's a nice demonstration that you are indeed performing coherent Rabi oscillations. Uh, I want to ask a question about the diagram on the bottom right there. So, so here we have Kelvin sort of measured in tens of Kelvins. Yep. Uh, and is that picture sort of in one go making the case for why we, we can operate spin qubits at, at reasonable temperatures instead of like superconducting 0 0.01 Kelvin temperatures? It's one argument that people like to make. There are, I've got other slides which show you this all the way up to room temperature, which is fine, which is great. It's dandy. There are other problems though. Right, but that is one nice argument that, look, the coherence time of molecular spins is not the problem, right? There's ample coherence time. The problem is addressing, right? The problem is initialization, and we'll get there. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you mentioned this before, but how do you do multi-qubit? We'll get there. How air sensitive is this? This one wouldn't be great. I mean, vanadium doesn't really like being in the four plus oxidation state, so. That's not great. There are other ones, so the, uh, I'll get to, a, to the next one. Here we go. This is, this is another vanadium-4. I'll get to a copper one in a second. Copper's much nicer. But it depends on what the chemistry is. Right. So here's a va vanadium phallocyanin, so it's a vanadyl, so VO. Okay, so that unit, that's a very strong vanadium oxygen double bond um, embedded in a phallocyanin ligand. This has also got beautiful, this is from um, the Florence group, Roberta Cecily and co. Uh, again, we have lovely things here. So they're, oh, she's using TM this time. So this will be our T1 up here, and this is our TM. So again, microseconds, we're on the order of several microseconds. Okay, not terrible. And you can do lovely uh, Rabi oscillations. Here's an ex another example. This is a copper one, so D9. So copper two is usually fine, right? The problem here is that it, this is a square planar copper compound, they often like to go octahedral, so you do need to be a bit careful because water might want to come along and play games, play chemistry. It, it depends on the compounds, okay? But, I mean, manipulating things in air sense, you know, in air-free, oxygen-free, water-free environments is not that hard. Building devices like that, once you get the compound in, you're generally okay, right? I mean, we're dealing with people in the room that do ultra-high vacuum work anyway. Right? It's not a big deal. Cryogenics help you do that. Um, but actually getting the sample in there in the first place before you pump down and cool down, that's the hard bit. Yeah, but airlocks, it's all possible, right? Okay, so this is another nice example from uh, Joris van Slagren uh, in Stuttgart. And the, the ligand here is really nice because we've got carbons and sulfurs and nitrogens, no nuclear spins in that ligand. Of course, it's an anion again, so we have some cation nearby and there's a phosphorus, which does have a nuclear spin, and a whole bunch of protons, which do have nuclear spins. But these are some distance away. And so this thing is quite nice. It's got TMs on the order here again. We're on the order of microseconds, or tens of microseconds, rather. Um, up to room temperature, it's about a microsecond. Lovely. Delightful. Job's done. Why don't we use molecular qubits everywhere? 
You'll see why. <laughs> so this is doped, right? This is this is 0.001% copper in the analogous nickel two. So nickel two in a square planar environment. Uh, so nickel two is D8 in a square planar environment. All your spins pair up, so you have a spin zero ground state. So this is a diamagnetic analog of this compound. And so doping a little bit of copper in gives you a nice separation between your electron spins so that you can do this. If you made the pure sample, you wouldn't see very much. Right. Right, you don't just have to use single ions. You can do things that are more interesting with chemistry. And this is chemistry out of Richard Wimpenny's group at Manchester. Uh, and so this is a molecule. You can see a picture of it here, and this is the schematic. Uh, and it's called chromium-7 nickel. So this is an eight-membered ring of antiferromagnetically coupled metal ions. So the parent compound, which is actually this picture, uh, is chromium-8. So eight chromiums in a ring. And the chromium uh, ions are in octahedral environments. And chromium-3 in an octahedron gives you a spin three halves. So it has a ground state spin of three halves. But each chromium ion is antiferromagnetically coupled to its nearest neighbor. So as you go around the ring, the spin three halves are all compensated exactly by their neighbors. Up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. OK? So this parent compound, chromium-8, is spin zero. But what you can do, chemistry, is replace one of the chromiums for a nickel. And nickel two is a spin one, not a spin three over two. And so the spin is not compensated anymore. And so you have an antiferromagnetic arrangement, that's fine, but what you end up with is this giant ring has a total spin of one half. So you can think about this giant ring as behaving like a single unpaired electron, which is kind of nuts, but it does. Okay? Now, once you do this, you're changing chromium 3 plus for nickel 2 plus. You have to compensate the charge. And the way it does that is by having a counter ion, a cation, in the center. Okay. Yes? Do you know how they uh, created the antiferromagnetic coupling? So the, the antiferromagnetic coupling is via magnetic super exchange. And that usually is dominated by these fluorides that are on the interior of the ring, but also the carboxylates, which bridge on the exterior of the ring. So it's held together by fluorides and carboxylates, and this mediates super exchange coupling. Yeah, so it's Heisenberg-like S dot S coupling, antiferromagnetic around the ring. Yeah. OK, so here we go. We get uncompensated spins. Uh, and so we have this delocalized total spin 1 half around the entire ring. And NMR spectroscopy actually can tell you what the spin projection is on each site, which is quite nice. Right. So this has a ground. Uh, spin one half state, and it is indeed a qubit if you want to call these qubits. Okay, and so the faith memory time is on the order of hundreds of nanoseconds now when you're below five Kelvin. We're a lot worse now, we've got all these other things going on. Okay, uh, this is the experiment here that that's the um, Han Echo experiment. You can see it oscillates a lot, so that's not a Rabi experiment, that's just a Han Echo, and it oscillates a lot. If I, oh, I didn't have it here. Um, uh, due to what's called ESIM, electron spin envelope echo, electron spin echo envelope modulation, and what that means is when you're doing your um, Han echo experiment, you're also having some uh, excitation of coupled nuclear spins, right? And so if you're on the right frequency to also pick up, you're flipping an electron spin and a proton spin, right, simultaneously. Then depending on how long you're doing your pulse, you can manipulate those as well. And so this is modulated by the proton Larmor frequency. And so if you include that in your model, you get a very nice fit. So that's what that is. It's a nice way of measuring hyperfine as well, if anyone's interested in those things. Uh, OK, so what does this have in terms of T1 and T2 in this case? Ah, Well, as a function of temperature, we get down to, there we go, something on the order of hundreds of nanoseconds. Can we make this longer in these molecules? And this is where we get chemistry being pretty cool. If co decoherence is dictated by nuclear spins and protons, uh, and well, in this case, also phonons, because we have a big wobbly molecule, um, what can we do about it? Well, chemistry is really cool. And so you can make these compounds with whatever you want. So you can change the carboxylate on the outside. You can change the cation that's in the middle. And you can make all kinds of different molecules. The adamantyl is pretty fun. You can put cesium in the middle. It's all good. Uh, and so you can then measure the TM times of these. This is all at 5 Kelvin, I believe. And you can see that you get some enhancements by decent fractions up to on the order of, of microseconds here. OK? Right. More monometallics, but now we're more exotic oxidation states. So this is work from Bill Evans' uh, lab in Irvine. And so here we're taking a rare earth ion. This is yttrium. 
uh, and making it yttrium-2. So yttrium-3 has no unpaired electrons, but in a molecule you can make it, and then you can reduce it by throwing <laughs> electrons at it, basically. Uh, and so you can make an yttrium-2 compound here. So this is an anion, uh, and this is quite interesting. So this has decent coherence time, so we're on the order of, what are we, microseconds? There we are, microseconds here. Okay, this is in frozen solution. You can make this for yttrium, lutetium, lanthanum, and an analog with scandium, these all have one unpaired electron, they're spin one half, S-like ground states, um, and you can do coherent mutations, perfectly fine. You can also quite nicely uh, make the analogous uh, ytterbium compound, in this case ytterbium-2 is F14, it's closed shell, it's diamagnetic, and you can make it in the crystal form and dope in some yttrium, and you can therefore measure these up to room temperature. Okay, perfectly fine, again on the order of microseconds. The weird thing about these compounds is that their unpaired electron looks like it resides in a dz squared orbital on the, uh, on the yttrium. This is actually a little bit misleading because it's only 50 or 60 odd percent metal based. So this unpaired electron has a lot of character of living on the ligands. Um, it's a, we don't fully understand this, this is work we did a few years ago, we don't fully understand why it behaves like this, but it's quite a weird compound. And this is all measured in, in, um, in the solution phase. Uh, or, or actually, we've done this in the crystal phase as well, um, without diluting any of the nuclear spins. And the fact we can see coherence with all those protons around is kind of weird, and we don't quite understand that. Anyway, when you start reducing compounds, they do weird things. So that's one thing to point out. Okay, so here's a nice plot that is sort of your comparative how do they compare to other types of uh, qubits in terms of T2s or TMs. Um, so here we have NV centers as a function of temperature up here. And at C60, that's an interesting one. But here we have our molecular qubits, and they're doing okay. Right? There's nothing, nothing wrong with those timescales. Right? The problem is other areas. Okay. How are we going for time? Still got a little bit, don't I? All right. Assembling qubits. So you wanted, someone asked a question of how do you do multi-qubit gates and all this stuff. Right. Here we go. So we don't really care about single qubits. That's kind of passe, a little bit boring. Um, how do we keep, how do we put them in arrays, how do we couple them to allow two qubit manipulations or whatever we want to do? Well, you could just make a molecule that has two spins, right? So this is an example out of Takeji Takui's lab, uh, which has two tempo radicals. I haven't talked about tempo, but this is another nice uh, stable uh, radical, okay? And these are actually labeled with uh, N15, so you got rid of the nitrogen spin one nucleus. And so you have two radicals, one spin half at the end of each molecule. And here, you need the ability to address them separately, right? Uh, and the way you can do that is that this molecule is not perfectly symmetric, and the way it is, um, it, it, its con conformation is, is such that at any given orientation, you have two distinct frequencies, right? Because they're not, they're, they're, they're anisotropic. And so at any finite magnetic field and orientation of molecule, you have two specific frequencies that you can hit, okay? So in principle, you can, you can address these two things separately. And so this is called G-engineering, which is a whole, there's a whole lot of work on this. It's really nice. So how can you build up more than just two? Well, if we go back to this chromium-7 nickel, it's anionic, and the counterion is a, a, an amine at the center of the ring. And what that means is that you can make an amine that has an arbitrarily long chemical thread. And if you can build a ring around it, you can put two sites and build two rings. Okay, so this is what we call a rotaxane. So this is a, a mechanically interlocked molecule. This, this kind of stuff won the Nobel Prize, Fraser Stoddart and, and Co. a few years ago. Um, this chemistry is beautiful because you can do whatever you want now if you can make rotaxanes. So here's a really nice example. So this is not doing rotaxanes. This is actually substituting on the back end. We'll get back to rotaxanes in a moment. But you could make a, an arrangement where you have three of these rings in a single molecule. Okay, so you have three individual spin one halves. Or you could do four by making a different molecule. Or you could do six by making a different molecule. Or you could do 12 by building what's called this Fujita cage, which is a palladium-based supramolecular cage on which vertex you have a thread and on which thread you can build a ring. And so you can have all of these there. Beautiful. It's lovely chemistry. It's gorgeous stuff. What could we identify each uh, of them? Due to the, maybe the symmetry of the geometry. So 
these, this is the hard bit, right? How do you individually address any of these things? Because they're all the same, right? They're all the same. And they do have different anisotropies. So at any fixed orientation, yes, you probably have a unique frequency. Uh, so what you mean about the 12 qubits, all of them have different anisotropies? No. So these individually will all have more or less the same anisotropic uh, spectra. But for a single molecule of this type, for a single orientation, because they're all pointing in different directions, I mean, there are some symmetries, so you wouldn't want to put it, you wouldn't want to look, say, along this direction, because then these two would be the same. What do you mean, orientation, that we have some kind of the, like, whatever Hamiltonian, or just some kind of external field that uh, breaks the symmetry of, of the molecules? That's right. So in EPR, we're always applying an external uh, fixed magnetic field, right? And so if you can control the orientation of your molecules in, in the sample, then you can put that magnetic field along a specific direction. And if you can do that, then these, because your, your external magnetic field is impinging on different orientations of these local reference frames, the anisotropic um, uh, resonance gives you different frequencies. Uh, yeah, so that's why we can distinguish the different qubits. Okay. That would be the, the idea here, yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. So does that mean that I have to align all my molecules in the same orientation in order for the two radicals to be addressed separately in the previous? Correct. Correct. And so the way you can do that is by having a molecular crystal, right, that has them all in the same orientations. Yeah? Predictably. Right? Deterministically. And then you have a single crystal, and then you have an external field that you can do whatever you want with. I can pick that way or this way or this way and have different resonance. And if you can dilute them such that they are far apart from one another, but each molecule has still two spins, then you're golden. And you can do two qubits, whatever you want. There are other problems. We'll get there. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yes? So with this, you can create like CNET and ISWAP gates? You could do, in principle, whatever you wanted. Right. So what about infinite arrays? People have thought about this. So metal organic frameworks as they're sometimes known, you can make these scaffolds that are three-dimensional, and you can build essentially whatever you'd like. So this is a graphic, um, again, from Dana Friedman's lab, where the idea is, well, you can build these, these arrays and put spin qubits deterministically throughout these things. And then perhaps, I mean, MOFs are famous for gas storage and sensing and all these things. So if you now have this array that can have gas analytes or whatever they are come in, and in interact closely with spin centers, well, do you have a nice way of using molecules as a quantum sensor for whatever analyte it is? And there are some anal analytes that are of spin relevance. For instance, um, NO gas, right, has a, has a spin. And so you can, that can come into pause and, and interact with spin centers. There's some lovely work out of Manchester on that as well. OK. Can you do that in practice? Yes, you can. So this is a low spin cobalt 2. Um, type molecule that, that is at the center of all of these faces here. Uh, there is a nuclear spin on cobalt of 7 over 2. This is our crystal field splitting diagram, which demonstrates the spin 1 half uh, in a low spin cobalt 2 environment here. And you can then do your Han echo and your um, inversion recovery experiments and measure T1 and T2. So we have here that whatever that is, 5 Kelvin, 15 odd microseconds. Fine. Other people, so this is um, Yambayashi. I think that's from, this is from the Florence group again, the Cecily group, using their vanadyl uh, phallocyanin type ligands put in between these copper paddle wheels, which space them out nicely um, to give you these, these kind of arrays, which you can again measure T1 and Tm, show coherent mutations. It's, the frequency is linear in, in, in uh, microwave power. Again, that's what we want to see. This is dilute, so now we have uh, vanadyl diluted in the titanium analog, which is diamagnetic. Okay. These will all be up on the, on the drive, so you don't need to worry about trying to take photos. But does the picture on the left suggest that we should sort of stay at like 50 Kelvin or something like that? Well, it suggests, it, it's, it, what it tells you is that there's no dependence on temperature below that, right? Because you're already limited by some Something. And in this case, it is almost certainly nuclear spin diffusion, right? In most cases in these molecular things, it is, right? I mean, if you look at the ligands on this, there's protons hanging off each of these. It's not drawn on, but there's protons off everything here. So they're everywhere. And unless you make this thing with deuterium, which will still have an impact, it's just less of an impact. Yeah. Let's get a quick 
question. So by performing this Han echo experiment, you're basically measuring the property of the ensemble, right? So there are a lot Correct. of modules. How well is this metric for describing like a single molecule of, of that kind, right? So, so is, is the question, how well does this measurement reflect the coherence time scale of individual molecules? That's a really good question. And the simple answer is mm, there's only one experiment, and I'll talk about that if I get there in the second lecture, um, that's actually done it on a single molecule, right? Um, this is all bulk, right? So this is, this is indicating that yes, the spins can be coherently manipulated. We haven't, most people are not doing it on the single spin level. So that's, but that's a really good question, yeah. Hi, um, I have a question. Um, so right now we see we can um, create a 12 qubits, but like for future, like for future path, if you want to um, scale up the qubits like 2,000 or like, um, I don't know, like million, like mm -hmm. I, I'm just curious, like what's your opinion or thought, like how can we direct, uh, how can we like go for it? Well, so that's exactly what these, these kind of systems are good for. So these are infinite lattices, right? So if I have a macroscopic crystal on the scale of millimeters, I haven't done the maths, but that's going to be billions or 10 to the 20 odd qubits in a defined array with all defined distances between them, right? So these are infinite crystal la molecular crystal lattices that pack in these structures, these frameworks, right? Now, if you can make a single crystal that is perfect with no problems, you know, no defects and things like that, then you have one array that is billions of these things, which is fantastic, except they're all the same. So how do you address them differently? That's the big problem. Yeah. Um, so with MOBS, um, would the metal that forms the framework interact with the qubit and then create problems like decoding? It could. It could. Absolutely right. So in this case just before here, the framework here is built with these copper paddle wheels, right? And that could be a problem because coppers have unpaired electrons sometimes, depending on their oxidation state. In this case, they do. But copper paddle wheels are also known to have a very strong antiferromagnetic coupling within the paddle wheel. So these have an S0 ground state. So at, at low temperatures where you'll be doing any spin physics, they're S0. Yeah? But also coppers have a nuclear spin. So you, you, there's no free lunch, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, the, these arrays are the, are the way of trying to build beyond single molecule structures into infinite networks, right? Just as a follow-up question, why can't we use non-uniform magnetic fields to be able to address them differently? Absolutely, you could, if you could manipulate a magnetic field to be non-uniform over the scale of nanometers. What's the state of the art? Sorry? What's the state of the art? What's the, pardon What's me? State of art? What's the state of the art in terms of manipulating a non-uniform magnetic field? Oh, that's beyond me, but it's not nanometers. I mean, yeah, not, not, not controllably, that's for sure. I mean, by accident, probably. But that's, that's not really the best way to do it. Uh, so that's a good point. Yes, if, if you could, if you could de define some kind of array that would have a non-uniform magnetic field. I mean, look, the separations are angstroms, 17 angstroms, right? So that's 1.7 nanometers. So if you could have an oscillate or some kind of periodic or semi-periodic or aperiodic array of magnetic field that was deterministic over a macroscopic sample at that fidelity, then absolutely. Yep, that would be awesome. Sounds like an engineering challenge for someone to... to try and do? Uh, just as sort of a different uh, question, uh, since we could build uh, infant lap, lap of these, uh, can we consider each group of uh, molecules and like metal centers as a single qubit? Each. So we're doing uh, bulk within the like in some calculation within every that in a sense. I, if I understood the question, could you consider one ensemble as a qubit and then have another ensemble as a qubit? Is that what you're asking? Yes, so assign the qubit to be kind of like what they do with the error correction. Uh -huh. uh, so assign a redundant amount of molecular qubits to be your logical qubit.
Yes, and I, there are two ways you could think about that problem, and I will hopefully get to them in the second part. Okay. So I think I will leave it there before we go on to lanthanides, um, because that's all a whole different kettle of fish. Uh, yeah, so any final questions before? Yep. Also, a question on this. So, uh, I mean, addressability is one thing, but also, do you have interactions between the spins? Because if yes. you cannot get, do you have interactions between the different sides? Oh, yes. Okay. So, there's di so, each of these electron spins have a dipolar magnetic field, right? Which you can't get away from. It permeates free space. So, these are all dipolar coupled. If not having infinitesimally small super exchange coupling via all these chemical bridges. So, there is all to all coupling right? Which is good if you think about it like that, but it's also bad if you want to do things controllably, right? And how do you switch the coupling on or off? You can't really. And we'll get there. Uh, are these coupling distance dependent? Yes. So the dipolar coupling is inversely proportional to the cube of the distance, right? Super exchange, not so. That's more about how you connect them via chemistry. But generally speaking, the more bonds you put, the weaker it is. So you can make very strongly coupled spin qubits by putting them very short. And there's a, a lovely paper on that chromium 7 nickel stuff where you can make them different distances and measure the exchange coupling. Yeah. Highly related question. So protons are bad, but it's only because you have so many of them, right? Um, but there's an averaging out of that effect, but it is there. Um, in solid state spin qubits, hyperfine coupling tends to be the much more important thing. At the site of the qubit, yeah. as in metal hyperfine. Yeah, I mean that's so, that's here as well. Same thing here. Same thing here, uh, but, but but that you know that, that's a different energy scale, right? Yeah, exactly. Vastly, and so in many cases, and we'll get to a few, hopefully, um, that's advantageous. You can you know just like we've seen before, you know these guys doing gas phase stuff, you can use that to your advantage. They can become your logical levels, ah, right? Store them there. Yeah, all that stuff. Absolutely. So that that can be a good thing, but it can also be a bad thing if you don't want it. It depends on perspective. What is TM again? Is it the phase memory time? So it's just the time scale of the, the decay of the Han echo intensity. Oh, it's just the D2 echo, basically. Sorry? It's D2 echo? Basically. Call it that, yes. Yeah. Depending on which community, you'll have a different name for it. TM, T2 star, just call it T2 and let's be done with it. Yeah. Liquid crystals can use for the immobilization and maintenance of certain like, axes. I think there's been one experiment, and I can't recall who's done it recently. But people are trying to do this, yeah. Because it's cool if you, can, if you can manipulate exactly how these things are aligned and you don't have to make a molecular crystal. And Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, let's catch up after the break, I guess.